This is Ari Koretsky, and welcome to Jews You Should Know, introducing the broader community to interesting and inspiring Jewish men and women making a difference in our world. Some are already famous, some not yet so, but each is a Jew you should know. We are back with another fabulous episode of Jews You Should Know, marching ever so quickly towards our 100th episode in just a couple of weeks. Again, a special surprise coming up there. Very, very excited about this week's episode. Another incredible woman. Last week we had Dina Kraft, host of the Hadassah podcast, The Branch. This week we feature Chaya Fishman. Chaya is someone I've known for quite a few years. She actually did some work together with me on campus when she was a very young woman. She still is a young woman, and even then it created extraordinary things, and since has done all that much more. Chaya has become an absolute role model for many, many women, in particular women in the business world, female entrepreneurs, and women in related fields, as the founder of the Jewish Women's Entrepreneur, or JWE, which is a network of mentorship and conferences and business development for women, primarily observant Jewish women, but really all Jewish women are included within their purview. As you'll hear from Chaya's story, she was herself an entrepreneurial spirit from a very young age, although actually nowadays she is a corporate lawyer working in mergers and acquisitions and making her mark in that industry while also supporting so many female business owners. So a real treat to hear from Chaya today. Meanwhile, as always, please subscribe wherever you're listening, whether that's Apple, Google, SoundCloud, Spotify, whatever it may be. Send any comments to jewsyoushouldknow at gmail.com. Follow us on Instagram and Facebook at jewsyoushouldknow spelled out fully, or Twitter with the letter U. And of course, please continue to share our content and our podcast's presence with those who listen to podcasts and just don't know about us yet, or with those who are just discovering this fabulous medium for the first time. As I said, often no better way to do so than through the window of Jews You Should Know. And now to our conversation with attorney and founder of the JWE, Chaya Fishman. We are here with Chaya Fishman, an attorney and founder of an amazing, amazing organization supporting female entrepreneurs. Chaya is someone I've known for many, many years myself, and I'm very excited to finally be able to connect with her and feature her on this program because her story is really unique and inspiring. How are you, Chaya? Hi, good. Thanks for having me here. Thank you for joining us. As we're speaking, our live conversation is happening late on a, a week night and uh, still in the, still from the office. And I know you work long days, although as you told me uh, off air that you, you often or usually try to be home for the family and then uh, only work late occasionally. But uh, it sounds like you have a lot going on. This is a busy week. Yeah. Yeah. So you, usually it's Thursday nights are my late night. Otherwise I, Pretty, do some pretty crazy juggling to make sure I'm home for dinner and bedtime. That's kind of a non-negotiable in our house, which for the most most days it works. This week it will not. <laughs> There's always exceptions. To that, so. Yeah. yeah. So all anyone knows who's listening, this we could be recording on a Thursday night. So there we go. <laughs> oh, you know what? I like that. I like <laughs> that. <laughs> let's just pretend it's, it's that Thursday. Script. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so, Kaya, let's take it from the top. Where are you from? What was your upbringing like? And I just had the pleasure, actually, uh, for those listeners, I know Chaya's father a little bit as well for my work. I had the pleasure of, of spending some time with him a couple of weeks ago at a conference in Connecticut. But right. tell us where you're from and, and a little bit about your upbringing. Sure. So I was actually born in Jerusalem. I grew up, um, my family moved to Cleveland, Ohio when I was, I don't know, maybe three um, so I grew up in Cleveland. I went to, I would say I grew up mainstream, Orthodox. Um, I went to a pretty ultra-Orthodox school, 
and I'm one of eight. I have six brothers and one sister. So a lot of fun, a lot of chaos. <laughs> and as you mentioned, my parents are in the outreach space, the Jewish outreach space. So I grew up in a very open home, a home that was, you know, very loving and supportive to all kinds of humans, Jews, humans, really anyone. And um, that really shaped a lot of who I am, just growing up in a home where everybody's welcome, everybody was supported. We were really encouraged to ask a lot of questions. And my parents were really supportive um, in whatever we wanted to do. I think every single one of my siblings ended up in a different school eventually. And my parents really gave us the space to choose and to pursue that. And I'm super grateful for that. I went after high school, I studied in Israel for a year and a half at a seminary called Darche Bina, which was a really positive experience. And then after that, I went to Landers College for Women in um, a division of Turo College in Manhattan, and I majored in finance. I met my husband just as I was graduating. And at that point, uh, we moved to Baltimore because he was studying for Smicha, for rabbinic ordination at Ner Yisrael, one of the biggest yeshivas in, um, I think in America, right? I think it's number two. Yeah, something like that. Something like it's that. A, it's, it's a big, distant two if it is, but it's a... <laughs> it's a big place. It's a big place. <laughs> it's a big place. So he was studying there. We moved there. We got married. We moved there. And then I worked a little bit as an analyst, as a financial analyst remotely for a boutique New York investment firm. And then kind of, I knew that wasn't where I really wanted to land. Um, well, so taking you back to your to childhood a little bit, growing up in this very open home, what was the experience like in terms of, you said it was you know very welcoming and encouraged a lot of questions. Was it difficult growing up in kind of that spotlight and sort of, you know, all kinds of people coming into your house and, sort of looking to you and to the children as examples and was that a difficult position to be in? So it's interesting you ask that because it's something I really took for granted until pretty recently. Um, there's, there's a few pieces here. One is my dad, we always had this custom at the Shabbos table that someone would share some sort of words about, you know, of Torah, of the Torah portion. And more, more often than not, my dad would kind of put me on the spot and I would share something. And so I was always very empowered to kind of speak publicly. I was always very comfortable speaking publicly and kind of just being put on the spot, which was actually a really, really good prep for lawyering down the right. line. But in terms of, you know, having to be an example, I think, you know, when I get up in the morning and I'm driving down to work and it's usually very early in the morning. So there's not a lot of people out and that's kind of my, my time. And I think about all the crazy things that have to happen that day. I think about my kids. I think it's like, it's like this weird time where I really get to introspect and my kind of morning prayer is always like, please God, let me be able to make a kiddish Hashem today. Like let no, I don't know what's going to go down today. I don't know what kind of craziness is going to land on my desk or, you know, what sort of, deal is going to speed up or blow up or, or what, but whatever happens, like, let me be someone who's a positive representation of the Jewish people. And that's sort of a value that was really instilled within me from growing up in a home where people are kind of watching you. My parents never had a conversation with us that said, you know, Hey, people are watching, you know, do a good job. My parents are just super authentic, but the way that we were raised, it was very clear that we needed to be role models and that we needed to do the right thing. And that, you know, people, you know, it, it wasn't that people were watching. It was that we had this opportunity to kind of be that positive light. And that's something that's always really stuck with me. always, always really resonates. And I really start off my morning that way. And it's, it's funny that you asked that question because I really credit my parents that that's sort of my mindset and how I start my day. It's kind of naturally evolved from growing up in an outreach home. And again, it was never like a conversation like, oh, you know, be a good role model, be a good example. It just kind of was understood that we had this responsibility and this opportunity to just good be, be good people and shine a positive light on Judaism, 
um, and, you know, be a positive force in the universe. It's it is, yeah, I come at it from the other angle because being in that outreach role, wanting to make sure, you know, your kids imbibe that message, but also don't feel necessarily the pressure to quote unquote perform in a certain way. And it's interesting that, you know, it sounds like you rose to the occasion and you were naturally comfortable with being in that limelight. I could imagine other kids maybe not being as you know naturally comfortable with that. Yeah, but I'll tell you the truth. My, my parents, I really give them credit for this. There really wasn't a lot of pressure. So for example, whether we stayed at the Shabbos table or you know I was reading a novel on the couch for most of the time or nobody ever said, come back here. It was not a very, there weren't a lot of rules in our home. And we, I laugh about it with, with my parents now because I've got a seven and two year old and I'm trying to figure out that balance of, you know, giving structure without kind of being overbearing. And I, I just never experienced that growing up. It kind of was, you be you, you share when you want, how you feel, you know, m my dad would put me, you know, would put me on the spot because he knew I was cool about it. And if I ever didn't want to be, I just kind of shrugged and he never pushed. Um, but yeah, I think it was because it was subtle and my, my parents really went with the flow. I really appreciate that as an adult now. So now you ultimately, uh, as you said, you were engaged in a little bit of finance work um, and ultimately you ended up going to law school, but yeah. of course simultaneously um, taking a, a route that is very entrepreneurial or at least supportive of entrepreneurs. So what did you start to do in your life that called you to law school and, and also that started you down this other path of launching an organization eventually? Sure. So jumping back to my childhood, I launched a business uh, when I was 16 and it started as just one summer camp. Um, it was a creative arts camp for young girls. There was basically, there was a gap in the community where there was this age where, you know, it's, most of the young girls were going to sleepaway camp. And at that point it was, you know, if you were too old for a backyard camp, but either you couldn't afford to go to sleepaway camp or you didn't want to go to sleepaway camp or sleepaway camp wasn't for both halves of the summer, there was really nothing for this age gap. And so I also had a real interest in like the creative arts. And so I put together a program. It was a camp for, it was, it was two grades at the time. It started with I don't know, maybe 40, campers or students um, in the first summer and it focused on just different there were different workshops that the girls could choose from we put on a, kind of like a broadway show at the end of the summer they could choose to be part of that there were all there was gymnastics there was tennis and i kind of hired all these specialists and and rented a college campus to host this endeavor and it really grew over four years it we ended up at you know the highest point there were about 120 campers at least a 17 person staff. And it was a real business, it was a legitimate business, it was an LLC. And as a result, a lot of the women in the community started reaching out to me. And I was, you know, I was young, I was, you know, still in high school and they, they wanted to know like, how did you launch, how did you decide to be an, become an LL, to choose to be an LLC versus incorporating, you know, all these kinds of technical questions. And I realized at that point that we are, there were so many resources out there for female entrepreneurs there really wasn't any network or support group or mentorship available specifically within the observant community where there are so many additional layers. There's a lot of, whether you want to call it, you know, cultural nuances or whether it's because there's just unique family size differences, but there's, there's a lot of variables that make running a business more challenging, or I don't want to say more challenging because I, you know, you, it, that's not a fair statement to make, but just a unique set of challenges that no other organization really could solve or properly holistically support. And so kind of as a teen, I had in my mind, hmm, one day I've got to start something to support this group of women. And then, you know, fast forward, like you mentioned, went to college, we moved to Baltimore, was working as an analyst, and I knew that I was going to have some, I wanted to pursue some sort of grad, graduate degree, maybe an MBA, maybe a JD. I was kind of back and forth. And at the same time, I really wanted to launch this nonprofit. I kind of made a bet with my husband. If I applied to law school and got in within a week, then 
it was kind of, it was kind of the, a crazy bet. Then I was going to quit my job, launch this nonprofit and somehow start this nonprofit and start law school at the same time, assuming I, you know, I got in. Doesn't sound but, like a great idea looking back, does it? <laughs> the whole thing was kind of ridiculous, but in the end, and I, I actually remember talking to you at some point about, about law school. I, I don't know if we were in touch once I had gotten in or before, but in any case, so got into law school within a week, quit the job, launched the JWE. It kind of exploded a lot faster and became something much bigger than I imagined. When I launched it, I launched it as, so the JWE stands for the Jewish Woman Entrepreneur. And right now, it, we're a national nonprofit, and we help Jewish women launch and grow successful businesses and organizations. Really, the ultimate goal is promoting financial stability in the greater Jewish community by helping women successfully grow and build businesses. Um, we help women really from all backgrounds, but we've really hit a nerve within the observant community. Again, as mentioned, where there are unique needs and we are able to meet them. So when I launched it, though, it was really, really as a mentorship program. And then I started law school and in 2013 put on the first business conference for observant women entrepreneurs and 350 women showed up. Wow. And so this was, when you first started, you said you started as a mentorship program. So yeah, sorry. What was, what was your initial concept? Was it just, okay, I want to help women who are just starting a business or want to start a business, pair them with somebody, get a little bit of advice. and kind Yeah, of yeah, pretty much that. So it was basically, I put up, I put up a website and I put up a mentorship application and any woman could submit it. And it went through, what was your stage of business? What was your industry? And based on, you know, the input, I had a you know, Rolodex of successful female entrepreneurs that I had sort of curated my own little support group. And someone could submit an application and sometimes the question was just a general business question and so I'd match them to one of the women you know, in my little network. Sometimes it was industry specific and so if they weren't already in my network, I'd go out and find them. And it was, it was pretty informal. You'd complete an application, we'd have a conversation so I could identify what the woman actually needed and then I'd make a match. And without advertising or letting anyone know, and this was before like social media was so hot, right? So I, there was really no way that I was getting the word out. It kind of just was. And just from Google searches alone, there were a couple hundred applications that just came in. And it was like, oh my, I think I've hit a nerve. Let me see if, if I put together kind of a meeting place for all these women to come together. So some of these organic relationships, some of these relationships can form organically, then, you know, maybe that's a better way to go about this. Cause I was just inundated and, and I was in my first year of law school. Also, um, I Which actually, the hardest had, year. Yeah. right. And I had our first, um, our first child, my first year of law school too. So it was, why not? Why not? <laughs> why not? So it was a year of lots of, babies being born um, and because it really was the, the organization really was a baby to to me it still is right. so put on this conference it was a big hit over 350 women show up there was actually this observant woman her name is Talia Mashiach she's the founder of a huge tech company called Ebed she had one you know Ernst and Young entrepreneur of the year I've been following her slash stalking her on the Google for quite some time and in my mind it was this woman represents like everything I want to be. She was super ambitious, super had, had portrayed, came across as someone with just incredible integrity, incredibly family focused. But I mean, a real, from Chicago, this woman? Yes. I've read about real, her. Talia yeah. Mashiach. She's, she's the founder of Eved and a total powerhouse though. You know, so she was this perfect combination of like, you know, proudly Jewish, awesome mom, rock star entrepreneur. And I was like, this is my person. If I'm putting on this conference, she has to be the keynote. And so I tracked her down, talked her into attending and she did attend. And after that sort of things started moving really fast. Did you have to pay her by the way? You know, I think I did actually. Really? I, I think, no, I didn't pay her a fee, but I think I flew her in. Right, I think sure. I was scrapping them together, the, the, the money for her ticket, right. which was a lot for me at the time. Yeah, you had no budget. <laughs> I had no budget. 
Um, but she, she didn't have a speech. She did not charge us. A, she waived any speaker's fee, which was really generous. And I mean, just attending, she, at that point, it was not, it was not easy for her to show up. Right. The hotel was not actually near an airport. She had to like, it, it was, it was amazing that she actually showed up and she did. And she stayed the entire day and she's someone I really consider. Yeah, a mentor. Mashiach, your savior. Yeah. Yeah. She was my Mashiach. Yeah. Um, She's an amazing human. So, so yeah. So after that kind of things exploded, we started city chapters. At one point, there were like twelve city chapters meeting monthly. I mean, things kind of moved, and the organization kind of grew very fast. Then kind of scaled back, then ramped up, and and right now we just had our fifth annual conference in this past May. We sold out. Um, it was over four hundred women attended. It was in Williamsburg. It was it was really meaningful because it was at the Williamsburg Hotel which was built and by one of the JWE board members, Toby Moskowitz. Interesting. She's just an amazing, awesome Jewish woman. You should feature her on this. I would love to. And it was just, it was, it was really, it was really special. So, so right, right now we're in growth mode again. Why, um, why did it scale back? Why did it go through those kind of? So, so, you know, the organization, like any startup kind of had ups and downs, right? So I'd consider myself a social entrepreneur and oh, there was funding, there were, there was manpower issues, really the same kind of mechanics and challenges that any startup goes through, you know, a non a startup nonprofit is the same thing. And so I think that there were a couple things, but I think the biggest is we just grew really fast and we just didn't have the infrastructure to support that kind of growth. And it takes time to figure out that you can't support everybody at the same time and you can't be every, everything to everyone and that you really have to grow slowly to be sustainable. And so, you know, I, there was so much, the need was so great and there was so much to do and I, and I wanted to do it all. And that just wasn't a good growth model. And so, you know, at, at some points to the extent, and, and we've always been a volunteer driven organization. So when you're, you know, operating that way, you're just completely dependent on your volunteers who are incredible, but they also have lives and businesses of their own. And in our case, our volunteers were all business owners who, and, you know, had their own families. And so that was always, you know, tough managing. Um, so, you know, right now we're kind of in this really good space where our mentorship program is strong and growing. And that's the same kind of thing as when you started where a woman could just say, hey, yeah, I'm starting out. Yeah, we send an application help. online and then yeah. our program coordinator sets up a call and facilitates a match. Um, we focus now, we have our annual conference and we then we focus on very industry specific uh, workshops so for example, we had a manufacturer's brunch, which really focused on, you know, inventory management and stuff like that. We have a social media summit coming up in September. So, you know, we put on some, you know, really focused larger events throughout the year. Separate events from the main conference. Correct. And in terms of local events, we really push people to create those on their own. And to the extent we can share share those events or support them in helping to shape those events. You know, we we're always happy to help, but we see ourselves more as a clearinghouse for those kinds of events, right? People let us know and we push out the word um, rather than kind of filling that niche. We really try to stay focused on national and the places where we can make the biggest impact, which is our mentorship program. And then the industry focused. Right. What are your, what does the uh, relationship become with other, I guess there's similar kinds of, enterprises, not yeah. specifically for women, but for yeah. example, we featured uh, Shia Rubenstein on this podcast mm -hmm. and he runs a lot of things for the JCC of Marine Park, but which I say is kind of like a, a cover or misnomer because he's not he's not running Maccabi games. He's running all kinds of yeah. you know, uh, different yeah. events for yeah. industries and real estate and, and conferences. What's the relationship with those kinds of yeah. uh, efforts? So we actually worked together on an event called Tribe Works exactly, right, a tribe while works. back. And the JWE was one of the supporters and collaborators of that event. I mean, our stance in general is, you know, we're happy to support and collaborate with anyone. So, you know, him for he he puts on great events. They're not, you know, they're they're not necessarily they're not geared towards women. Right. To the extent that, you know, anyone reaches out and says, Hey, we're putting on an event, it's technically supposed to be co-ed, but our lineup is all male because we don't, you know, really know the right female speakers or we don't really know how to make this event inclusive, but we want to. 
we're always on board to you know have a call help strategize and some organizations really lean on us for that and and others don't um, but our stance is always to the extent we could support others you know in in supporting the greater Jewish community you know we really want to help our focus is really on women so to the extent we can help facilitate supporting more women in more ways we're, we're always there for that so I want to ask a little bit about you know you, you reference the quote-unquote challenges although uh, not not your preferred term, but the unique dimensions of female entrepreneurship or female business engagement. How would you, I mean, I'm, obviously there are the, the really sort of self-evident aspects of managing, you know, home and children and child rearing and all those kinds of things. Are those really the major items that, that you're addressing for people? And if not, what are some of the less obvious difficulties? And then more importantly, how do you help women actually address these things, which are, quite frankly, you know, real, real issues in their lives? Yeah. So when someone reaches out for mentorship, I guess, you know, your question is focused more on what I, what I would call the, the soft issues versus the purely business issues. Sure, right? sure. So, so I'm not going to address the business component, but... I guess the business component could probably be addressed by lots of different outlets, right? I think what makes you guys unique probably is that you're integrating that with a yeah. real deep sense and sensitivity to the realities of, of these women's lives. Yeah, so, so there's all different kinds of issues that, you know, kind of come to mind. Some are just a function of being female, in you know certain male dominated spaces specific and some are more centered around the fact that most of our members or the women we support are observant and so uh, observance plays a role in a lot of ways so you know first depending on where a woman falls on the orthodox spectrum she may or may not have had access to secular education or a high level of secular education and she may or may not have has have had the experience of kind of interfacing with the secular world and that might sound crazy to some people but if you went to an all women's you know schooling your entire life you would never went to college and then you launch a business and now suddenly you know you're trying to get your product into target a you need to figure out how to maneuver in a network where you have zero connections, right? In the Jewish community, and especially in the observant community, like everybody knows someone. So, you know, you can call somebody who can kind of get you in the door somewhere. But when you're navigating an entirely new space, and whether it's going to a trade show and not, you know, knowing where to start, and it's not, and it could be from, you know, how do you even set up a booth? Where do you, what do you need to know? What do you need to bring to once, once you're there, how do you actually interact with people? What are the do's and don'ts? And again, some of that is just a newbie startup. And some of that is, okay, you're going to interact with men. Are you going to shake their hands? Okay. Let's say you're not going to shake your hands. What is the most graceful way to go about doing that? How do you appropriately draft an email? You know, again, depending on some of the women who reach out are super sophisticated and super savvy and write really, really well and really know how to maneuver. And sometimes they're, they're not, they might be savvy, but they've just never been in the, you know, secular universe before. And there's a different set of rules. And so they kind of learn that. And so the most valuable thing I found is when someone reaches out and says, and, and again, this is where there's that perfect integration, right? They say, Hey, I, you know, I've got a new product. There's this trade show happening at the Javits or one great story is there was one happening in Vegas. And so someone reached out and she said, I, I need to know like what to do, how to go. And I want to know, is anyone going? Because it's over a weekend and I'm not going to have my booth opened on Shabbos. So like, what do I do? How do I navigate that? But also like, is anyone else going to be there? Because I don't want to be there alone. Right? So there was this great story where we set up, it was, you know, a woman, she was from a Hasidic, she was a Hasidish woman with, you know, a, a couple other women who weren't Hasidish, but were also observant. One was more modern Orthodox. One was what I would call kind of mainstream Orthodox. I don't really know what all these labels mean, but kind of work with me here. And, and they all, they all went together to Vegas. They all, you know, had no one at their booths, you know, on Shabbos, they made Shabbos in their hotel rooms, they all, you know, got rooms on a certain floor, so they could be, you know, take the steps so they could, you know, 
get downstairs and walk outside. And they kind of all coordinated. And, and there were so many levels of support there. Number one, a community was created. So now, oh, instead of someone going alone, they went with peers. They had someone to, you know, that they could have dinner with. They had somebody to have Shabbos with. Number two, there was somebody to give them kind of to walk them through the ropes. So one woman had, you know, done this a few times. So she was, she had all these pointers, like, here's the basics of what you need to bring, but here's, you know, the best time to be there. Here's the best people to try to engage with, you know, and then, you know, so there's like that practical business piece. And then there's the actual religious piece of like, hey, you know, I'm not going to shake someone's hand or I'm not going to be there on Shabbos. Like, how, what's the impact? How do I actually do that? Do I just leave my booth unguarded? Do I just pack it up on Friday? Right. So very practical. Yeah. So all of those pieces kind of come together. So when somebody reaches out, you know, sometimes it's purely a business question, but often it's, you know, I might be figuring out what's the best way to set up a manufacturing plant in China. And I'm going to actually have to go abroad and do that. But being able to talk to another observant woman who has done that and also is a mom and, you know, and is again, also observant, like having, you know, they say you can't be what you can't see. Right. So being able to see, wow, there's someone, she's wildly successful. You know, she's going to give me practical advice, but her existence, right. Is meaningful to me as an entrepreneur, just starting out because if she can do it, I can do it too. Right. So much of it is also that. And so we really facilitate those relationships. And because the organization is, you know, already eight years old, we have a really nice network of women. And some of these women are just doing hundreds of millions of dollars of business. And it's just unreal. Again, while maintaining their observance, while, you know, staying true to their Judaism, while raising families, while staying true to their values, and, you know, while really killing it. I mean, it's, it's pretty cool. I want to kind of ask you a broader question about the whole enterprise. And it's interesting because, you know, one of the, I'll call it sort of critiques that I get sometimes about my own podcast, about this podcast, actually. Um, and it's really kind of an internal dialogue that I have with myself is that, you know, of course, I'm generally featuring people who are exceptional in some way, right? People who are doing unique things, who are doing things that, that not everybody else is doing. And, and hopefully people can take inspiration from that. And, and people will sometimes remark to me, you know, does that kind of downplay or intimidate in a certain way, kind of the regular pedestrian or quotidian individual just going about their lives and you know, raising their families and putting in their nine to five or nine to six or seven or whatever it is, and not necessarily doing anything that's on the surface extraordinary. Um, you know, and kind of the question people sometimes ask me is like, who really is a Jew you should know? You know, like, how do you decide? And it's a really, it's, I think it's a fair question. And it's something I grapple with, you know, in, in thinking about this podcast. But I wonder if, if you think about the same kind of question in the sense of, you know, are we, do women ever become sort of intimidated by the organization? You know, they look at and they say, oh my gosh, these women that are doing these hundred million dollar deals, they're like these quote unquote super women. And that whole myth, is it something that ever has the reverse effect of actually making women feel inadequate, um, which I can imagine people looking at and seeing. Yeah, that's a, that's a great question. Because in past years, I really drove kind of the speaker lineup for our conferences. And my goal was I'm going to scour the universe. I'm going to search high and low to find a wildly successful, observant woman entrepreneur to be the keynote of our conference. All of our panelists have to be extraordinary. They have to, you know, have really knocked it out of the park, right? That was always my approach and my mindset. The proverbial superwoman. Right. Well, this year, we hired Abby Wallen, who's amazing, and she oversaw the conference. And she said to me, the first conversation we had, she, she said, Chaya, I know you're used to running the conference your way, but I'm telling you right now that you're making a big mistake because there's a whole universe of women who are doing a great job and they're successful on their own terms, right? What does success even mean? Do you have to make a hundred, do you have to be generating a hundred million dollars in sales to be successful? And, you know, there's so many women who are, you know, kind of what we'd call your average small business owner. Just want to make a, a basic living. And they just want to put food on their table right. and they're killing it because they're 
putting food on their tables. And that's how they define success. And so she put together this think tank of women and it really had a spectrum. It had some really small business owners. It had the core of it was your mid-sized business owner. And then it had a couple wildly successful women too, but really the core group was this kind of your, your average small business owner. And we really worked with them to say, well, what kind of content, like who would you want to hear from? And what we ended up doing at this past conference, and this was what was probably the most successful component, was we had these round tables. And some of the round tables were led by women who, you know, were, you know, building a company poised to go public, right? And some of these round tables were hosted by women who were generating 250K in sales and they were very happy to them. They had made it. They were not looking to grow anymore, but they had, you know, they had stable businesses, they had viable businesses, and they, you know, they were strong and they had what to share. And we had all different kinds of roundtables and they were very topic specific. So you had one on, you know, managing your employees, building, you know, building the right team. And that obviously had to be for someone who was of a, a a business that was large enough that they're actually hiring, right? And that was an issue. And then you had roundtables on topics like creating an Instagram page with a compelling story. You had how to price yourself in the service space, much more kind of tangible. And it didn't really matter if you were huge or you were mid-sized. And the speakers at these tables, the women who kind of facilitated these conversations, many were just these, you know, mid-sized, I don't want to say just, but they were mid-sized business owners. And it was wildly successful because you are right. So many women, right? Everyone defines success differently. And for some women, hearing from somebody who's selling their product in 6,000 showrooms in America is a little bit daunting and isn't, isn't necessarily relatable, right? I happen to have felt that the panels that we had, which by the way, all the content is available on the jwe.com, cool. but little plug there, <laughs> but oh, um, I would say we really pushed the panelists to, to provide really practical advice because we wanted them to be relatable. And I really felt we really pulled nuggets from each of these women, no matter what stage of business or how large they were. But we did mix it up this year and we did get a lot of positive feedback from women who really wanted to meet other women who the goal was to really just have a sustainable, stable business. And so, yeah, for some people, they don't, you know, they look at somebody who's so, so far ahead and they just say, well, what am I? Right. And, and I think we have, we put together this video, which was really great can also see it on the jw.com or on our YouTube channel, but it was like, how do you define success? What does success mean to you? And, you know, for some women, it was like, if I'm fulfilling my dream, then I, that's success, right? For, for others, it was, if I'm putting food on the table and supporting my family, that's success. And I think about it all the time. I mentor a lot. That, that's kind of a mantra that I, I have. I mentor a lot of young women who are, you know, looking to pursue a legal career. And Something I, I always say is like female empowerment is really, it's ultimately about the ability to choose. It's not about climbing the corporate ladder. It's not about making it to the top. It's about the ability to be able to choose. Do I want to get on the ladder? Do I want to climb? Do I want to take a break? Do I not want to get on at all? Right? Do I want to go all the way to the top? Wherever you want to go or whatever you want to do, right? Like Female empowerment is about having the ability to make those choices. And if your choice is you want to stay, stay home and be with your family, and if your choice is you want to try to juggle it, and, and, and you know, whatever, whatever you want to do, you should have the ability to choose and you should have the resources to be able to make those choices properly. And that's really the focus of the organization is, you know, we want every woman, Jewish woman everywhere to have the ability to articulate and achieve her personal and professional dreams. And, you know, we want to support them in that. But our mantra is never all women should work or all, all women should be business owners, right? I was going to ask, do you ever get pushback from people who say, hey, you're not, you know, valorizing the, the role of the, the traditional role of the woman as the home take, homemaker and so forth sufficiently. And, you know, I feel kind of judged by this sort of movement. Do you ever get that kind of pushback? We really don't. And I think it's because we've been very careful about our messaging, which is very much, if this is the choice, if you want to pursue this pathway 
we're here to support you in that endeavor, but we're not at all going to try to tell you what to do or how to do it. But if this is the choice you've made, we're gonna give you access to as many tools and as many resources as possible, and we're gonna help you be as effective and efficient as possible, right, in pursuing, in pursuing that path. But, you know, it's your choice. And, and we really focus on that. And, and I think that's something that really, across the board, all of our speakers and the women who are really in our network, these are women who are really family focused. These are women who really care and, you know, they love their kids to pieces. And whether, you know, you could love your kids to pieces and still work crazy hours. It doesn't mean that they're not traveling to, you know, internationally all the time, but these are, are women who will always say, you know, family first. And I'll, I'll never forget Talia Mashiach, she said this story in her opening address where she said, you know, she had this opportunity. She was invited to this select group of women, you know, um, founders to this intimate brunch with Sheryl Sandberg. And she said her, one of her kids got sick that day. And whether it was that specific child needed her home, you know, cause I know with one of my kids, if they get sick, I've got to be uh, present. Child has different needs, right? Yeah, with the other, like you know, I I put them okay. in front of a movie and go to go meet with Cheryl Sandberg. And right. so, but she said she knew that for this child, she needed to be home, and so she stayed home. And the entire audience like stood up and clapped, right? Wow. Because everybody in that room understood that that was an amazing opportunity, and everybody understood that sometimes you have to turn down amazing opportunities. And I I very deeply believe that everybody in that room would have equally clapped if she had said. Hey, this kid would, was sick, but I had a great nanny who was doing a great job watching her. And so I went to the meeting too, because I, as a mom, made a decision knowing my kid and knowing all the variables. And that was, you know, the right choice at that time. Because I think that there's kind of this community that understands and we believe in each other's judgment calls, right? We believe that we love our family to pieces. We are passionate about our Judaism and we are smart enough to make the right choices of, you know, when and how we balance it all. And that's the beauty of the JWE network. And I think that's the beauty of kind of being a, you know, multifaceted Jewish woman, right? As we get to, we get to make these choices. And, and I think we've really created a space where women have strong values. It's clear that we all have strong values and we've really learned to trust each other for the decisions that we make. Because I think sometimes women can be each other's own enemies, right? With all the judgment and the mommy wars. And I'm just a, a firm believer that we all need to trust each other's choices more. It sounds like it's really a group of people who are judging each other favorably, really. Yeah. Um, yeah. From ethics of our fathers. If I just starting to wrap up, you personally chose to become an attorney. Yeah. Um, and at the same time, you had this really super successful creative arts camp. You were this budding entrepreneur as a, as a teenager and young adult. Why didn't you go the, the entrepreneurial route yourself? And, you know, in a certain way you did as a social entrepreneur, but you built the apparatus supporting all the other entrepreneurs. Yeah. But you yourself haven't built kind of your own company. That's probably surprising to a lot of people. It is. It is. So, and I always say back, well, you know, I'm a social entrepreneur you know, building the JWE is definitely just like building any business. But I think, so, you know, the easy answer is there were a certain level of tools and skills that I really wanted to obtain that I felt specifically pursuing a career as an M&A lawyer. You know, I, 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 most of the work I do is mergers and acquisitions, right? Buying and selling of companies. And so I felt that would give me really good insight into how successful companies operate, the good, the bad, the ugly, getting exposure to all kinds of industries. To be honest, when I made that choice, I, I didn't really know what I was getting into. <laughs> I feel at this point I can say I, I've learned so much, I've gained so much. But back to, you know, I like to think that I'm kind of on... I'm, I'm on this sort of adventure, right? So at, at this, at, at the, that point in, in life, I needed a, I could not take on risk. I needed to, at, at our family stage, you know, we, we could not take on risk as a family. And I very much wanted to keep the JWE alive. And I also needed a, you know, stable career. And I was trying to find a space where I could really learn and grow and have the ability to leverage that, you know, one day. And I'd say, I, I feel I, I have, and I am gaining those skills. 
And who knows what happens next, right? I, I don't know. I don't know. But but at, at that stage for our family, that was the right choice and it was a tough choice. I'm sure it was. But at the same time, again, you're, you've kind of created this uh, superstructure to support so many other entrepreneurs in a way you are. The Talmud says, greater is the one who has allowed others to do rather than doing themselves. So you've You've started many businesses in a certain way, and uh, you are an entrepreneur in that respect. Kaya, tell people where they can learn about the JW more. Where can we, uh, you said you can listen to things online, you can uh, yeah. channel, website. Yeah, so the best content is if you follow us on Instagram, it's at the JWE, so T H E J W E. I always just tell people Jew spelled wrong. <laughs> you can also go to the JWE.com. We also have a YouTube channel, the Jewish woman entrepreneur. And, um, but again, we do interviews every Sunday on our stories on Instagram. So that's really the best place to get some really good content. Very cool. Chaya Fishman, JWE founder, attorney, mom, family centered Jewish woman. <laughs> Thank you so, so much for joining us. For having me. This has been Ari Koretsky on Jews You Should Know. Please visit us at JewsYouShouldKnow.com and subscribe at iTunes, Stitcher, or wherever you consume podcasts. Find us on social media at Jews You Should Know. If you'd like to become a supporter of this podcast, we would greatly appreciate that. And you can do so by visiting Patreon.com. That's P-A-T-R-E-O-N.com slash Jews You Should Know. Finally, if you have enjoyed this podcast, please leave us a review so that we can continue to grow and introduce many more people to Jews you should know.